Well, welcome back to another installment of Ministers Joe and Josh Discuss. We are discussing today, oh, another fun one, Minister Joe. This is the story of Judah and Tamar, but it's really more than that. That's just what my subtitle says. Mm -hmm. But we're in Genesis 38. Genesis 38. So let's take a look at the, at the text here. It also implies, too, let me just put this out right off. Yeah. It, it also implies that there's been a, a distance of time here. Uh, you know, uh, we talked about that compressed history. This, this, I mean, for this to happen, I mean, there, there, all the, the changing of events, there's, there's some, some time has lapsed. Would yeah, you, and that's important for you to say and for us to remember that this is not a chronological history ne necessarily. If you do your study, um, here, before we get to that, if you do your study, um, there are a lot of different opinions among commentators and theologians as to why this story of Judah is, is shoehorned. It feels shoehorned here because you have the story of Joseph being sold. And then after this Judah and Tamar kind of side story, you'll get right back to the events of what happens to Joseph when he arrives in Egypt. So this feels a little strange. And you might think, well, this is what happened next. But that's not necessarily true. Most scholars don't think so. In fact, this we know that this has to happen before Jacob and his family moves to Egypt. <laughs> mm -hmm. But other than that, we don't know when it occurs. He's quite a long way from Dotan. There's, there's every evidence here that there's quite a distance of time. Some of this might have happened before the selling of Joseph, like when he first moves there, when he first gets married. I don't know. Is it after? Is it before? Very hard to say, because he yeah. has uh, several sons that are going to die in this story, and they're not going to like die like one, you know, within three weeks of each other. So he's got a period of time, and then there goes a while where he wants his youngest son to grow up, and so he refuses to allow him to marry until he gets old enough. So we got years going on here, and we don't really know where it corresponds with the story of Joseph, before, during, in the middle, after. How do we know? But the point of the writer of Genesis is not the chronology. That we get this in the Gospels, too, where some of the stories are not in the same chronological order in each Gospel. Chronology is not as important because this is a theological interpretation of history. The Judah story has been put here for interpretive reasons, not for chronological reasons. Mm -hmm. So when you and I approach this text, we're not going to read it like you would a history book where we say, well, this must have happened next. Right. We're going to read it as though the author needs us to learn something from this incident in the life of Judah that is going to be important for the overarching story. Right. So that's, that's the eyes we have to have. Um, and that's the difference between reading the Bible as a theological, a theologically interpreted history and a simple history, simple history. You go, well, of course, we're going to talk about Judah and Tamar. This happened next. Mm. But in a theological history, we go, no, this is here. It might have happened next. It might have happened before. It could have happened way later. It might have been concurrent with what's going on in, with Joseph in Egypt. This might have been happening at the same time, but there's no way to know. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's important to the author. If it were important to the author, you would get some clues. And the English translators do translate things strangely to make it sound like you do have cues, but they're being a little uh, liberal with their interpretations. But anyway, we'll get to mm -hmm. some of that. So here we are in Genesis 38. I'll read some of it here. I mean, and we'll give just a little warning to parents. Some of the material here is, you know, maybe we're going to deal with it in a PG way. But it, it's, it's, some of it's a bit mature. Would you agree, Minister Joe? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so if you're watching this with your kids, um, young kids, you you might want to pause it and wait till later. I mean, this isn't Grimm's fairy tale, but uh, it's it's certainly not not something you're going to use for a, a bedtime story. This is a this right. is a, te a teaching moment, but uh, right. pick pick your time wisely. Yeah, so we'll give that little caveat before we get into this. So here we are in Genesis 38, verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and settled near a certain Adulamite whose name was Hirah. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He married her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. 
Again she conceived and bore a son, whom she named Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she named him Shelah. Shelah was in Chezib when she bore, or she was in Chezib when she bore him. So again, these sons are going to grow up. So this is a long period of time covered in this little short story. That's the point, right? Yep. And also, again, reinforcing the idea that the woman named, named the, the sons. That's a theme that we've seen, right, throughout Genesis. Yep. And also, she's not uh, where she's from as well. It's not, she's not a, uh, within, within the family of, of or in, in relation and somehow with, with uh, Jacob. Right. She's a native to the land. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. But since Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, he spilled his semen on the ground whenever he went into his brother's wife so that he would not give offspring to his brother. What he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up, for he feared that he too would die like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. So we'll stop there for now. There's enough, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Judah is following in the footsteps, and I think all the sons of Jacob will do this. I don't think we ever get another story of anyone going back to Laban's house to look for a wife, but we know why, right? Because they drew that line in the sand. Yep. <laughs> and Laban said, don't come back here. <laughs> I won't go to you. You don't come to me. So yep. the, the door back home to acquire wives has been closed. Shut down so, for service. <laughs> so we probably shouldn't read Judah as being necessarily rebellious here or anything like that i don't think we get a picture of that but he does marry a canaanite he does not marry an ishmaelite he does not marry a midianite he doesn't marry within the family of abraham which he could have done e edomite an edomite sure yeah. he could have done any of that he doesn't right um but he marries uh a canaanite from the city of adulam or the we, we call it a city probably like an encampment right in these days and she she bears him her name was shua she bears him three sons and then he finds a wife for his oldest now we don't know where this wife is from we don't know where tamar is from but is it a safe assumption to believe that she's probably a canaanite like her like her mother-in-law I, I think i think that uh, proximity would would uh would give that as a, a good answer mm. i think so too Now, you and I talked about this a little before we recorded. Again, we keep talking about this as a compressed history. There are so many details we would like to know. Wouldn't you like to know what Ur did? Well, I mean, you always got to question those people with, with a two-letter name, uh, <laughs> what they did. But the only, the only thing worse than that is a four-letter name. So I don't yeah, know. yeah. There, <laughs> are, there are some pretty significant two-letter named people who get some rough treatment from god in in the scriptures the other one i'm thinking of is og og of bashan but uh yeah i he was wicked in the sight of the lord lord put him to death that must be pretty serious because we've seen a lot of wickedness to this point and we haven't seen god put anybody except sodom and gomorrah to death right yeah that's true so this is this must have been some substantial wickedness well yeah it does make you wonder if if uh what he what he did was maybe uh was was associated with what happened in Sodom. You you I do wonder that because we saw Simeon and Levi do some pretty rough things. We even saw Reuben cheat with his father's concubine and none of them got killed by God for it. And here Judah's firstborn son, which would be in the same family line, is killed for whatever he did. So there might be a reason the writer of Genesis doesn't really want to tell us what he did. Right. But obviously it's pretty severe to get this treatment, you would think, in these days. Right. There's no law, right? There's no law of Moses. So it's not as though you could adjudicate exactly what God would want people killed for or not. 
There are two examples in the Bible. The first is Sodom and Gomorrah, but that's not the first example of when you would kill somebody in these days. But that's one of them. The other is after the flood. Remember, God commands Noah that if anybody murders a, a person, that they have to be killed. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that his sin is either murder or something akin to what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But we yeah. don't know. And the, the worst part about it is that, that it's actually, uh, that it's actually uh, Tamar that, that if that would be the case, unless it was somebody else. But I, I guess, you know, there is that, there is that thought in my mind that, it, that he, he did something that was displeasing to God, to her. That's what it, it could be some, some type it of violation. Be. Yeah, it could be, or, or somebody in the city. So anyway, he's wicked. And so God strikes him down. And then it's an interesting little tidbit here. So Judah is aware of, the, of what will later be called in the law of Moses, the Leveret law. We've talked mm -hmm. about this in our series through Ruth, mm -hmm. right? There's a requirement that if brothers live together and one of them dies before producing a child, that the next brother is to marry his widow and the first child they produce will be in the name of the, of the man who died. So we saw this with Boaz and Ruth. Yep. Um, and that's going to be part of the law of Moses. But there is no law of Moses at this point. Right. So this is, I think we're finding out that the Leveret law is not just a feature of the law of Moses, but apparently is something that's in the land or at least within the family of Abraham as an expectation, which means now if it's just the family of Abraham, then it could have come from Ur, right? Could have come from Sumeria. If Maybe it's in the land. But obviously this is a an expectation that precedes the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. And it will later be called the Leveret law um, and become part of the law of Moses. So it, Judah has this expectation and says, go in, take Tamar as your wife and produce a son for Ur. Because Judah wants the firstborn, mm -hmm. his name to carry on, which would mean this son would most likely be Judah's heir. Right. Onan doesn't like any of that. He, right. he is the heir now, right? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of similarities with Ruth. That's with right. The Kingsman Redeemer. So. Exactly, who didn't want to do it. That mm -hmm. that nearer Redeemer didn't want to do it, and neither does Onan. Right. But rather than just saying, no, I don't want to do that, and passing it on to his brother to take up the responsibility, Onan just practices a very early form of birth control. Mm -hmm. And it's effective. And that makes the Lord upset. So apparently this leveret law, even though there's no law of Moses, God expected him to do it. Mm -hmm. Is this interesting? Like the dynamics where there's no law, but God is upset? Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's, it's based on the law on the idea of violating the, 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 the person. So, so the focus, the focus for Onan in this situation seem, seems to be uh, for self-gratification. You think so? I, I think I, I think so. Uh, uh, because well, yeah, he must have been. Yeah, he must have been intimate with her, obviously for self-centered reasons, because he didn't want to do what he was supposed to do. Right. Yeah. That's so the if that's what you mean, yeah. 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 It, it, and so and so in some ways, it's a, it's it's kind of a, an insult to her as yeah. well. Do you think the sin here in God, now we're speculating to some degree, but not like without some textual grounding. Do you think the sin is here that he wouldn't do the leveret responsibility? Or is the sin that he's not taking care of a widow? Or is the sin that he's disobeying his father? Maybe it's all those things. But it seems to me that loyalty to one's parent is a higher value at this time in these patriarch stories than anything else. So I wonder if it really has mostly to do with the fact that Judah asked him to do this and he's refusing. But because um, Tamar is cared for, Judah keeps her in his house. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to, to think about, like, how would they know? Right. Other than Tamar saying, this is what he's doing. Yeah. Well, yeah, and Judah clearly didn't know. Yeah. It's, it's God who knows. Mm -hmm. And God kills him. So now Judah jumps to the most natural conclusion anyone could jump to. 
I married my oldest son to this woman and he dies. So then I marry my second son to the same woman and he dies. So the problem must be the woman, mm. right? That's, that's his conclusion. And you can understand now he's wrong. Ur did not die because of Tamar. He did something. Onan did not die because of Tamar. It's because he refused to carry on his family line. But Judah has misinterpreted. And for that reason, he's afraid that if he gives his youngest son to her, the same thing's going to happen to him. So he delays it. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the setup to the story. Now, there are a couple of things we should probably make mention of. Now, many times, and this is where we're, we're going to keep this as PG as we can, but it's a bit mature content. So you got young kids. Pause it. Watch it when they're in bed. That's our advice. All right. So I, many times this passage has been brought to me as proof that the Bible is against self-gratification. Mm. That, that the, now, obviously, the Bible is against lust. So that, the teachings of Jesus are against lust. But many have brought this to bear on the argument that self-gratification is sinful. And that's why Odin was killed. And so when you said it was for self-gratification, I wondered if you were moving in that direction. Yeah. So for me, he's killed for not fulfilling his, his, his brotherly duty to his brother's widow. I don't think this has anything to do with God not liking the spilling of semen on the ground. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with you on that. I think people have used that, used that to, to argue against that. I, I would I would would like to f focus mainly on the insult it is to Tamar for 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 the fact that you know if if, if he was indeed it took her as a, as his wife to to disrespect her in that way for yeah for to self. refuse now today we use birth control all the time like people in the modern world use birth control all the time. They do family planning as they call it. And there are many people who get married who essentially do what Onan did by design. They either take birth control pills or they use some sort of um, barrier device to prevent pregnancy. So people do all the time today what Onan was doing, right? And I'm not sure it's sinful to do that. But in these days, I don't think it's sinful to do that. I don't think that's what this story is about. But you're pointing at some of the cultural specificness of where he was. Tamar, without having been married and having no child, she is, and we've been talking about this in Ruth and in other places, she is a widow. And she doesn't have the ability to care for herself in this part of the world as a widow. So she needs some kind of an heir or a husband in order to have a meaningful life in these days. So Onan is willing to marry her and take care of her, as Judah is, but not willing to give her an heir. And, and so they're leaving her vulnerable. So if you mean by insult that he's refusing to give her this measure of security for his own selfish reasons, I agree. That's, but that's if you, I didn't know if you meant to imply that it was simply insulting not to impregnate her, which may or may not been insulting. You don't, you don't know. Maybe she didn't really want to have his child. But what's, what's at stake here is her security in mm -hmm. the world. And that's what he's refusing to give her. He's selfishly refusing to give her a future. And that's right. what's at stake in the story. Right. And, it, and we don't know much, much more detail about her, where she came from or, or why. why he, why he would do this or what his brother did before that. Uh, so, so that, that those are, I think this, the scripture is less focusing on that because I think, I think it, it's, it, it's the, it's a setup right. in a lot of ways for what's to come, I, I think, but there, it, it's a grievous, I mean, we would, we would never do that. I mean, if, if I were to pass, I would, I don't, my wife would never allow, no, no, no. And you're, you're living in an entirely different culture. You know, this is not a land-based culture, and it's not this idea. Today, your wife could inherit uh, whatever you have in terms of your property, your wealth, um, whatever you have, she could inherit your house, your vehicles, you know, life insurance mm -hmm. policy. So she can make her way in the world uh, without the need for these kind of social structures to keep her safe. But if she lived in a world in which 
she could not inherit any of that. And all that wealth would go to your brother and or to the rest of your family until your kids were old enough. And she couldn't, or you had no children, which is the case here. So there's no children to eventually inherit it and take care of her. It mm -hmm. all is just reverting to the males of the family. If you live in that situation, then she is at your death, homeless, penniless, and helpless. Mm -hmm. And if she lived in a place where she could not buy property, she could not get a job to care for herself, she is going to the street because you died. So in this culture, the way to protect against that was this lever at responsibility where the one who did inherit your wealth, your brother, had to take her in and care for her and then had to produce an heir who once he became old enough could take her out of the house and care for her. So this is a type of social security. It's not one that we understand. Our culture is so different and I'm thankful to live in the one that we do. <laughs> but in those days, this was a type of social security and it's mostly built on the very patriarchal nature of this part of the world at the time. Women were so exposed and vulnerable if their husbands died and they had no male heirs. Right. Um, this is a way to protect them. And that's what Onan is refusing to do. So I, I just want to emphasize that this isn't, we're not going to talk about God's views of self-gratification. We're not going to do that. That's another conversation. But what I do want to say is that this story is not about that. It's about Onan's refusal to give Tamar a future right. for his own selfish reasons. He doesn't want to raise a kid who's not technically his. He doesn't want to do that. Or, or take what he, what he can grab right? And po for power, for whatever. Yeah, and if, if he does produce a child through Tamar, that child will now become Judah's heir. And as long as that child is never born, Onan is the heir. Mm-hmm. So we've already seen this in the story of Joseph, where the brothers are always jockeying for position. We also know that Reuben has lost his father's favor. Simeon and Levi have lost their father's favor. And Joseph's been sold into slavery. So Judah's heirs are the heirs of Jacob. Mm -hmm. He's the fourthborn. So, so Onan wants not just Judah's blessing. He wants Jacob's blessing. And if he produces this child for Tamar, he produces a rival for his own claim on the family line. And he doesn't want to do that. So that's what this story is about. Mm -hmm. And the way he prevents it is by using birth control. That's what he does. If it were written today, he would be, well, first of all, he'd never be in this situation, but let's say we were, he would be using some sort of a barrier method or um, slipping birth control pills into her uh, orange juice or whatever he would do to make sure she couldn't conceive. Yeah. I guess my point is, is that she's, she's not compliant to, to what, to what, cause it makes it sound like he's the one that's in control of that. Yeah. And, you know, there's not, but much... she's obviously aware he's doing it, but yeah, but, but yeah, she doesn't not... have any say. Yeah. It doesn't sound like she's initiated nor, nor that, nor is the wording that way too earlier with, uh, with 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 Judah, it says it says in verse six. I think it says Judah, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. So in other words, it, it wasn't like Ur was like this is the woman I want, or yeah. like they, they, this was typical uh, assigned marriage. Yeah, it was negotiated. And yeah. So yeah. so uh, there's part of the story we don't really know about Tamar. Maybe she was part of that that area and had influence or something like that. And here's Judah trying to build his legacy. Yeah. The reason this story is here, and I agree with what you're saying. The reason this story is here in some ways is to show us that these family dynamics about jockeying for birthrights and blessings that started with Ishmael and Isaac have extended through Jacob and Esau. And now we see have infected Joseph's, I mean, Jacob's family. It's also in Judah's family. Like that's what is at the heart of this. It's jockeying for the inheritance. And that is a theme that will run all the way through uh, the scriptures, all the way up to Jesus. Remember the story Jesus tells, the parable he tells about um, the, the vineyard owner putting the vineyard in charge of servants and then sending uh, and messengers to them. And then they keep killing the messengers. And then when he finally sends his son, they say, oh, this is the heir. If we kill him, we'll inherit the vineyard. And they kill him. 
Jesus suggests that's what they're doing in killing him, is that they're trying to kill the heir. It's that same story that runs through the whole history of Israel. Who's going to be first when you're out of here? Who's going to lead this thing when dad dies? They are obsessed with it. They are obsessed with it. And Judas' kids too. And that's yeah. what's preventing Onan from fulfilling the Leverite law. Yeah, but he, he, gets it. He, he gets killed too, right? He gets killed too. And who knows? I wish we had Tamar's side of this thing because Tamar is going to do something that might on at first blush look like a really evil thing to do. But really the way the story is written, she's doing the right thing. And it'd be very hard to imagine this as the right thing. You have to step into a different culture, a different way of understanding the world and how you navigate your way through it. What she does, if it happened in our world, would be wicked. Yeah. Even Moses' time. Right. I mean, even it, even Moses' time, it would have still been wicked. Been stoned. It would have been both stoned. Right. But in her time, well, we'll have you have to decide if you think this is right. I think the way the story turns out, it is right. Mm -hmm. But it's right for this time, and and that's not an insignificant thing to observe that some things are right for one time and not for another. Now we're not talking about the law of Moses. We're not talking about the general teachings of God, but um, there are certainly culturally specific behaviors in the scriptures that are never endorsed or encouraged, even punished later. And they're all through the patriarchs. So Abraham marries Sarah, who's his half-sister. That's going to be illegal in the law of Moses. Jacob marries sisters, Rachel and Leah. That's going to be illegal in the law of Moses. And what Tamar does here with Judah will be illegal in the law of Moses. But at the time, legal. Right. Oftentimes, too, it's it, these are, you know, we'll, we'll get into it more, but uh, there, God uses these things, uh, like with Ruth, uh, like with the cave with Lot and, and the daughters. God uses these things that 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 are based in human wisdom. To, uh, and why are we in this situation, Minister Joe, where the people are basically doing culturally whatever they think is right? while we're in this situation because we were cut off from the garden mm -hmm. and we insisted on eating from the tree of knowledge, which humanity in Genesis has never stopped doing. They're still eating from the tree of knowledge, which is seizing knowledge without God's guidance, just taking it whenever they want it. And that's how these cultures, according to the story of Genesis have developed. They've developed by eating from the tree of knowledge. They've developed by figuring things out on their own and coming up with values and cultural systems that work in their part of the world based on their shared history and experience. And that's how these, that's how Sodom and Gomorrah came up. That's how everybody, that's how the Sumerian empire rose up, which Abraham was called out of. So God is taking the first steps now to reclaim a people to whom he can give his instructions. But to this point, he has given very sparse instructions. And he certainly said to Abraham, leave her. Uh, he said to Abraham, sacrifice your son on Mount Moriah. You know, he, he's given instructions, but they're very sparse. He's not yeah. ever laid out a law or a paradigm of expectation, really. Just simple things that they are expected only to follow and obey. So, but the cultures they're living in, they're shaped by the eating of the tree of knowledge. That, at least that's the way the Genesis story goes. And right. one of the most pernicious things that keeps repeating itself is this desire for dominance and power. So you get that in the pre-flood world, right? The men were men of renown, warriors, conquerors. The Nephilim were in the land in those days. You know, th this was a, a cult, this, they seem to be cultures built on power and violence. That's why God eventually destroys that world. But as soon as he gets through the flood, the same thing happens. Um, Noah is somehow dominated by Ham. We talked a little bit about that sordid story. And then um, they try to build this tower and great city where they want to rule the whole earth from this city, which is another type of conquest, right? And uh, we've seen it over and over. Then even in the family of the holy ones, they are jockeying for position. Who's going to get the inheritance? Ishmael or Isaac? Who's going to get the inheritance? Jacob or Esau? Who's going to get the inheritance? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Joseph. Who's going to get it? And now in the family of Judah, who's going to get the power in this family? Well, Onan knows it's him as long as he can keep Tamar from having a child. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know? So it's just, it, it's the same story over and over again. And we might feel because of these cultural differences so distant from it. Like we've, we've progressed beyond this. But power is still essentially what we see in our world, people fighting for power, influence. We might call it respect or, or um, whatever, but we are looking to be properly treated and to have the, the ability to self-direct as we see fit. And in these days, it was only the person at the head of the family that had that power. So, of course, everybody wanted it. One of the differences today is that we've tried to democratize the ability to self be self-determining, make as many people able to be as self-determining as possible. And that does keep some of these little spiffs, you know, down, but still the right two people run into each other and only one can achieve, you're going to get the same story, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, sorry, I, I went off on my little, you know, <laughs> you know how I do. Minister Joe's used to this. He's been handling this for a couple of years now. <laughs> Yeah, we, we just don't we just don't uh we don't know what what they exactly did to displease the Lord. And I think I think essentially that that if that were that were the main importance of the story, and we probably already said this, it would have been stated. And uh and even even what he did, what Onan did, isn't specific enough s- specifically. It doesn't sp- articulate directly saying you have re- you have not given the child or you're you're trying to retain for yourself it doesn't it, it implies that yeah because i i would sort of disagree with you i think er is a complete mystery but i don't think onan is much of a mystery like that makes sense to me but you're right it's more implied it's more inferred than it is over well i don't know it says he killed him because he kept spilling his semen i don't know if you could get more direct than that that is pretty specific <laughs> Hate to, hate to be the eyewitness for that one. <laughs> I know. Well, thankfully, God does. He just, you know, he can be wherever he wants to be. Um, maybe a cautionary tale that don't think that just because the doors are closed, you can do evil. Because apparently God knows even the evil done in secret here, which we know. But sometimes it's good to be reminded. But here we have Tamar now remaining in her father's house. And Judah has is taking care of her but he's not giving his son to her. So that's where we are at the moment. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah's time of mourning was over, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers. He and his friend, Hira the the Adulamite. So I'm going to just stop there for a moment, Minister Joe. This might not be clear to any of our non-Hebrew readers. But the word friend in Hebrew is an interesting one. And it doesn't just mean somebody that like you go fishing with or somebody that you like to shoot the breeze with or somebody maybe you like to do some sort of a distracting, you know, basketball, billiards, whatever. Um, A friend, the word friend in Hebrew has to do with a co-laborer. It's somebody that you work with, that you're in common cause with. That's your your friend. Um, And so it's likely that these two... um, graze their sheep together that they work together is probably what it means a business so, associate yeah a business associate and they might have been more personal than that you don't know but it's at least that it's at least yeah. that i guess at, at first i was just a little a little confused by the way it was worded it says uh, in the course of time wife what uh the wife of judah she was daughter it, it doesn't doesn't say her name Right, yeah, we, we only still know the man. The father, we, the father of the wife. The father is Shua, but we, yeah, her, her name either was not preserved by the tradition of Israel or it was unimportant to the writer, mm-hmm. one way or another. I mean, maybe it was in the historical sources he was using but didn't feel the need to mention it. But I'm guessing that maybe he didn't know. Yeah, so it makes you wonder is that maybe he is a shua is a like an official is there is there something else about that name that we need to know yeah it's it's i think impossible to say yeah impossible to say yeah but she eventually dies we don't get any indication here that her death had anything to do with judgment or with anything like that it just says in the course of time so eventually she dies and when his time of mourning was over 
So there's a period of mourning. We don't know what it would have been in Judah's day. It's seven days today, I think. It's called sitting Shiva. Um, but it might have been months, might have been years. It's impossible to say in those days. He went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers. He and his friend Hira the Adulamite. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she put off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped herself up, and sat down at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. She saw that Shelah was grown up, yet she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I'll send you a kid from the flock. And she said, Only if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and the staff that's in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she got up and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the kid by his friend the Adulamite to recover the pledge from the woman, he could not find her. He asked the townspeople, where's the temple prostitute who was at Enaim by the wayside? But they said, no prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I've not found her. Moreover, the townspeople said, no prostitute has been here. Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own, otherwise we'll be laughed at. You see, I sent this kid, and you could not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the whore. Moreover, she's pregnant as a result of whoredom. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, it was the owner of these who made me pregnant. And she said, take note, please, whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not lie with her again. And he did not lie with her again. Mm -hmm. When the time of her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. While she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and bound on his hand a crimson thread, saying, this one came out first. But just then he drew back his hand, and out came his brother. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the crimson thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah. That is a sordid tale. Now, there's lots of detail there. <laughs> Isn't that funny, right? So much skipped over detail in the early part of the story, but this one is almost tedious in its recounting, right? Now, the most, when I hear people talk about this story, I think the thing that draws the attention in contemporary days the most is Judah's sudden turn from wanting to kill her to suddenly calling her righteous. And most people today will paint this as Judah being caught with his literally his pants down and wanting to save face by pretending that, oh, I overreacted. It's not a big deal. You know, and a lot of people will... I don't know if a lot of people, but there are certainly plenty who will make a big deal of the patriarchy here, a big deal of the double standard and all of that stuff. But there is actually a cultural reason for what's going on here. As abominable as this behavior is, like there's no question under the law of Jesus, this would not be tolerated. But we're prior even to the law of Moses. We have to remember that, right? All right. So, Minister Joe, what is Tamar trying to do? Well, I think I think she's trying to to gain some justice from from her her father-in-law who has been ignoring her and basically writing her off, uh, keeping her, keeping her within this this area of uh, mourning for for her husband, uh, and I think he's kind of Judah has kind of written her off as as a not not productive uh for for his for his heirs uh or bad luck or an yeah. albatross or right somebody and, uh, god doesn't like <laughs> right yeah and so so uh but from tamar's perspective she's trying to regain some status um she does use some unconventional ways of making that happen yeah yeah uh, and that that's what's important i think um so Tamar, we have further evidence here that this Leverite responsibility is of the land because Tamar seems aware of it and she knows to preserve herself. She needs a child in the name of Ur. And she seems to have accepted the marriage to Onan 
for that purpose. And she seems to be waiting for the marriage to Shilah for the same purpose. So she seems to be as aware of her need to produce a child for her as Judah was, but it's not happening. So she is going to do, and this, is a, this would be against the law of Moses, as you pointed out, and it would be a violation certainly of the morality of Jesus. But in her, to her thinking, she's going to have to trick Judah into producing the heir for his son. Yeah. Because that's what he does. These two children become Judah's heirs. They are seen as the children of Ur, and that's why the text says that he never slept with her again. He simply fulfilled against his will the leveret law. And that's what's behind him saying that she's more righteous than him. Mm -hmm. Because she has done what was required by tricking him when he wouldn't do it of his own will by marrying his son. Now, you might say, why didn't she just deceive the son? Why Judah? Well, I think the answer here is that the son still had not been given in marriage. So that would have been adultery. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, isn't adultery with Judah? Maybe, but he had been married. He is a widow. And he may frequent prostitutes. <laughs> is that beneath here? He doesn't have any problem going into a prostitute on his way to work. Like Judah's not a, you know, this is not our kind of guy. I mean, he, uh, just sent, he sent his brother into slavery in Egypt. And now apparently if he sees an opportunity on the road, he's going to take it. But Certainly not hard, harder to be more righteous than he is at this point. <laughs> right. So it's possible that she's protecting Shilah's innocence or chastity where she feels no need to have to protect Judah. Like she, so, so here she presents herself as though she were a prostitute. Now it's questionable as to how she does that. Like what leads him to that conclusion? It might just be that she was a woman on the road. <laughs> you know, that, that might have been all he needed. Now she never behaves as a prostitute. The townspeople don't know anything about a temple prostitute, but she's called a temple prostitute here, which I think is just a way of translating uh, what he says. But this might mean that he thought she was some sort of a religious prostitute, which is common in the ancient world in the Middle East. So Judah is certainly a man of this Canaanite culture, wouldn't you say? Sure seems like he knows the ropes. My goodness. And Tamar yes. is doing in her mind the right thing. And yeah, Judah, I, Judah agrees. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, a part of, part of what the teaching is here is that, that, that uh, the idea of, of realizing the, that, that implication of the right thing, even though it, it's coming from the, the wrong person, should you say in a lot of ways. Right. And being done in a way that we would today call morally wrong. And so would the law of Moses. But in this culture at this time, this was the best she could, she could figure out. Yeah. All well, the options are, were, you know, it's, it's one thing to say somebody left you, but they died. They were struck dead. So that, that that's there. It, it also implies to me that, that, that God was, God was wanting her to become pregnant to be one of the, I mean, you think he could have chosen another woman yeah. for, you know, and say, okay, we're just going to, you know, own in, you know, uh, I, yeah. I don't know if God wanted Judah to do this. No, I mean, Tamar. Yeah. But for her to become pregnant, that was what God was ensuring. Um, not through this with Judah, but through the marriage to own and then his judgment of him for refusing to do it. What should have happened is Shelah should have been given to her. Uh, but you can understand again why Judah didn't do that. Because he, he might have thought God was killing his children for this woman. So there's a lot, you know, again, we could talk and talk and talk about the cultural differences. And I guess I have been doing that. I want to make it clear that we are aware this would be evil today. But it's amazing what life lived apart from God's law, looks like. Like, look at this. They don't know what they need to know to make a good decision. If Judah had known that Ur was killed because he had sinned against God and not because of Tamar, 
and that Onan was killed because he was trying to keep the birthright for himself rather than producing an heir who would be his rival. If Judah knew those things, he would have had no problem with giving Shelah as a, as a husband to Tamar. But he didn't know those things. So he did what was best in his own eyes, which is protect his youngest son. If Tamar had known that Judah misunderstood and she could have helped explain it, then she might have done that. But she thought he was just being selfish. And so she took matters into her own hands. This is what it is to live without God. Like they're just guessing. And the morality is just a guess. Like Tamar is doing the best she knows how to do given what she knows in her culture. And this is her best solution. And you and I can look at it going, that's horrible. But we don't live in the world she lived in. And we live after the law was given to Moses and yeah. after God sent prophets to Israel and after Jesus came and clarified God's intent. And so we have a whole set of things from the Lord she did not have. And why didn't she have them? Because of Eden. Because she lived in a culture that was eating from the tree of knowledge, and it was simply making things up as it went. Yeah, it's def definitely you, you. You feel a sense of, of justice for Tamar through this through this situation, but in the same the same token, you see a sense of desperation from from Judah's perspective. From from uh, I mean, I hate to sound like a, like just the sympathizer with everybody's situation, but. It, there, it seems like it seems as though that 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 desperation, and you know, I'm surprised there's no there's no drinking of alcohol on here or, I know. or wine because it always <laughs> seems always seems to be one of the, part of that recipe where people are exactly are, are desperate and then do do things that that right. Are, we're thinking about Noah. We're thinking about <laughs> Lot and his daughters. We're thinking yeah. of you know, yeah, yeah. So so the the thing is is. Uh, the desperation that that I see in Tamar, but she seems to be the one who 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 understands the what what needs to happen, and Jude, Judah seems to be calculating this, but he's he's coming up with with the odds everywhere he goes, uh, uh, zero. Uh, uh, yeah, and we probably have to mention this situation where Judah's first instinct is say kill her, right? when he's the one who slept with a prostitute. Why, you know, there's obviously a double standard here in the ancient culture where men are getting away with things women aren't. And, and if you wanna focus on that, you can. But the reason he is so harsh with Tamar is because of her status. So she is not a prostitute. She doesn't have to care for herself. She's not part of a temple system. She's in his house and he's caring for her. And so she has a certain kind of status that would prevent her from needing to be a prostitute. So for her to go out and play the harlot for Judah is offensive because she doesn't have to. Like she's being cared for. Now he hasn't given his son to her, but he's feeding her, he's housing her, he's clothing her. There's no reason for her to go out and do that unless she's just simply sowing to the, her flesh. So it does look like a double standard and it is. But Judah doesn't have any problem, sadly, with the fact that there are prostitutes in the world. He doesn't have any problem with that. He doesn't have any problem using prostitutes. So that's abominable. But he has a problem with, with Tamar playing the prostitute because he has taken every effort to ensure she would not need to do that. Because that is the likely future of a widow when she doesn't have any children. That is the likely future. So the fact that she's living into that future when he has tried to protect her from it, even though he doesn't want to give a son to her, he still tried to protect her from it, and she went out and did it anyway, he's reading it through that. It's not as though women should always be killed when they act as the prostitute and men are fine. That's not, that's not how he's calculating it. He didn't try and hunt down that other temple prostitute to have her killed. It's, it's who Tamar is and what she means to his family and what he's trying to do for her that the prostitution that he thinks she's done is a, is a bigger insult to him personally and to his family than the temple prostitute, you know? So again, it's cultural, but we shouldn't say that this is the double standard where men can be lushes and women have to be killed. If, that's not what's going on here. Otherwise, he would have had 
his little intimacies with the other prostitute and then killed her afterwards or something or dragged her. But he doesn't do any of that. It's because of who Tamar is mm -hmm. and what he has tried to do for her to prevent that. Um, it's an insult for someone in her situation to go out and do this. Not right. because she's a woman, but because she's under his protection. Right. It, 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 I, know, I know it's like splitting hairs, but it's important. Oh, no, I, 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 I see it. I see it there. One of the things I, I'd like to point out that, and we can talk about, is how easily he gives away some the, these these signs to her as as deposit. Um, I mean, if he was, I don't think he was as concerned about about being exposed as a as as a, a frequent prostitute person. No, or, he doesn't seem to have any problem at all with it, right? Right, and, and so the, the real the real question is why he's giving her his his insignia ring. Which is like the family heirloom, or the almost like the birthright of of Esau, yeah. Uh, as staff, and 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 you know his cloak basically, or or actually it's a it's a, a rope, and so what is this a a, yeah. a cord a cord, uh, and so so uh, these things are all I think pretty much signs of of his identity. Yeah, he's like, like it's like leaving his license, right, or his passport, right. And, and he's more concerned that he'll be seen as someone that doesn't pay for her services than he is in being outed that he, he took part in her services. Right. Like, you're right. He doesn't care that, I mean, he's fine with going into a prostitute. Like, that's not a problem. But he wouldn't want anyone to think that he, he didn't pay her. So when yeah. she says, well, I don't even know you. You've got to give me these things and I'll give them back to you once you pay. He's fine with that. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. I'll leave my credit card. It's like, you know, I don't want to pay with my credit card. I've, I've met one guy who did this once. He didn't want to pay with a credit card, but he forgot cash at a restaurant and suggested that he would leave his credit card. And if he didn't come back, they could charge it. But he wanted to come back with cash. It's something like that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, he's, she's saying, what security do I have that you're even going to pay me? And he said, I'll leave my security. So again, you're right. Judah has no problem going into a prostitute, apparently at this time. And if he has no problem with it, he's not ashamed at all, and he doesn't care if he gets caught. What does that say about his family? Well, it's not only that, but it, it compare that with Onan. Yeah. <laughs> he impregnated her. So so that's that's even more like like he didn't he didn't realize that what might happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Apparently Onan knew of a type of birth control. Presumably so would Judah. But Judah didn't participate in it. Yeah, it's seems like he didn't care. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't care. But of course, they. He's only worried about heirs. The reason Onan cared is because he would make a rival for his birthright. But these any children produced of a prostitute in this culture would have no claim to any heir stuff. So it's not a concern for Judah. It's a concern for Onan. It just shows how the values are all wonky, right? Mm-hmm. Right, so, and then this the shrine prostitute is going to be for a foreign god. Right, he doesn't care about that either. Right, you know. So, so it seems like like Judah should have been struck dead just as just as bad as his, his sons are. I know, and it still makes me wonder what Ur did. Yeah. Right. If all this is getting a Passover, and we have to remember, in the Book of Romans, Paul says. That God does what he does in Jesus, in part because he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did this. He forbear, according to Paul. I think this is Romans chapter 3, but I'll make sure we put it in the subtitle when I get the right one. I think it's in Romans 3. But he did this in Christ because he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did this to demonstrate his justice in Jesus. One of the things that passage tells us in the New Testament is that God is not okay with all this stuff, but mm. he's not punishing it. Not yet, but he will. And he punished, punished some of them. That's the thing. <laughs> some of them he couldn't wait. Yeah. They must have been bad. Like Simon and Gomorrah must have been bad. Like whatever Ur did must have been bad. And this, this refusal of Onan to produce an heir for Ur, that must have been bad in God's eyes, like much worse because so many things he overlooks. He, 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 he waits right. to punish. So anyway, and it, remember, I, th I do think God holds people accountable to the light that they have. 
right. um, in his judgment. So these must have been abominable behaviors in this culture. They must have been abominable behaviors in this culture because God yeah. sees the heart. So it's so disrespecting to, to for life to, yeah. or the continuity of what what God is trying to do through 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 you know through Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob. I mean, it's it, it's that continuity. There's going to be that breaking right. point of 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 that of legitimacy in some ways, or to carry on carry on that 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 uh, promise to Abraham. That's the thing, yeah. You know, whenever we're and obviously the jockeying for power and and the the neglect of widows and the refusal to care for one that needs to be taken in. These continue to be big deals for God in the law of Moses right. and throughout. You know, even in the New Testament, James, the brother of Jesus, writes that religion, our Father in heaven, sees us pure and faultless, is caring for widows and orphans in their distress, and remaining unpolluted by the world. You could go right back to this story. Judah is clearly polluted by the world, and he won't care for a widow in the way right. that she's supposed to be cared for. So yeah. even though this is a very culturally specific expression of what it looks like to care for a widow, and we would not want to be caring for widows in this way today, mm -hmm. um, it's still essentially in that culture about caring for those who are left exposed, who are vulnerable. And, and God finds it abominable here, and he'll find it abominable in the New Testament. So it, it, there is a consistency. Right. So as we begin to wrap up, we get to the end of this story. Here's the funny, I find this funny, almost haha -ha funny. All these sort of details. You'd think that people who read this story would have problems with everything. But there's one part of the story that when you read commentaries, people have the most trouble with. And that's the scarlet thread thing. Hmm. nobody has any difficulty thinking maybe most of this is historical but there is no way a baby stuck its hand out got a thing wrapped around it stuck it back in and then was born there's no way that happened so of all the parts of this story it's the birth of the two children that usually gets the most historical criticism which is funny right it's yeah. funny haha but i understand it i this is very hard to believe do you agree oh yeah yeah, it's but but it's, it's not atypical for mm -hmm. the family line of Abraham <laughs> to have a battle going on with these kids in the womb. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it sounds like Esau and Jacob. Yeah. I mean, but the difference is, is Jacob's got the heel of, the heel of, uh, of his brother Esau. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you would draw this, but the picture that you get is that one of them puts the hand out. This is Zerah, and he gets pulled back in. And the other one finds his way out first, and that's yeah. Perez. You know, and obviously that's not the way birth works. <laughs> so, but remember, the, the conflict is being emphasized here, that one is trying to get out in front of the other, which was the same with Jacob and Esau. And it's also what was going on with Onan. Mm -hmm. it, and it was what was going on with Joseph and his brothers. Jockeying for position. So, so it's told this way partially so that we can understand that this thing is like a feature of the family of Jacob, the family of Abraham. They are constantly, and there is a theme that we should not, it's able. It's the blessing of God they're fighting over. Now they don't know what they're thinking birthright, but you know, but it's the blessing of God. It's the promise to Abraham that they're fighting over. Who's going to get it? Who's going to carry it on? Who's going to be the one? And they fight about it just like Cain fought Abel for God's blessing. Yep. Whenever God chooses to bless somebody, they become a target for everybody. And that is as true today as it ever was. So this story is told that even these children in the womb are fighting just like everybody else in the family is fighting outside. Yeah. So I don't know how this worked mechanically. If this, if this is pretty close to what happened, this must have been a horrid birth. Yeah, because what, like it, what it would mean, right, is that one of the children was in breach, right? That they were head down or something. But how in the world they'd have their hands up? Most people who study this say that this is absolutely impossible. It never happened this way. But to me, we don't have any access to the history. 
we just have to accept that this was a very unusual birth. Yeah. Almost I don't like know how a baby, but twins, you know, jostled in there. Maybe one accidentally got his hand out, um, you know, just as a smaller cavity and could, you know, who knows. And then the other one actually got, I, I'm not, I don't believe this is absolutely impossible, but I would say it's very, very unlikely. But the way it's being interpreted is in light of the theological meaning of these difficult births in the family of Abraham. Yeah. The jockeying for position and all of that. I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, it's uh, it sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie of uh, <laughs> of you know uh, you know I mean an alien invasion and these kinds of uh, uh, you know it the it's very very un, unlikely that it could have happened it, at least picturing it that way. That may have what they thought they saw, uh, you know. But uh, I mean, I, I was there for all the birth of my children. Cut all the cords the umbilical cords on, for, uh, at their births and as traumatizing enough, never mind seeing, seeing some action like this. Uh, so have you I, ever seen the birth of twins? I have not. I have not, but I, I, yeah, used to I haven't at, either. So I don't know um, what kind of movement there is among twin babies during the birth process and whether you might get an appendage out that comes back in Um or whether you might have one gripping the other as they're born, you know, yeah. um, the way that we have. But I'm guessing that with twins, I mean, we know babies move in the womb. You know, mm. my my son, when he she was in my wife's womb, he was moving like you I, you could see it on the outside of her skin as she got to the end of the pregnancy. Yeah. You, he was moving a lot. And I would imagine when there are two of them, that there might be some movement and oh, things yeah. could happen. You know, so I don't think these are impossible, but I would agree they're very unlikely, and yet they're a perfect image of the family of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah, and, and I think even in our culture, where where IVF is more more uh, more available, and multiple births are, are are becoming more and more pop, uh, not popular, but more more Common. reality. Yeah, where I mean, there was a. Uh, a family in a church when we lived in Manchester that uh, that that had several they had, they had uh, quadruplets I believe uh, maybe I'm getting maybe it was actually f uh, five so that's different but uh, I can't remember for sure but that they had a lot of kids all at once and and the 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 way things the way things work the dynamics I can't help but think that that. That probably in that in that situation it would have been more of a cesarean uh, situation. I didn't ask all those details, but the the amount of fatigue to birth a child, uh, just just one child, not several, uh, maybe I would think it would be exhausting to yeah. say the least. Yeah, uh, I agree. And a cesarean section makes sense to me too. Obviously, that's not an option. Um, probably for them in, in this day, or probably not a first option. Now, we have some maternity nurses in our church and others who work in birthing areas. So maybe they could give us a comment on how likely they think it is that during a birth of twins, you might get an arm that gets stuck out. Or because remember, the reason she wrapped that cord around is because birth order mat matters. Like right. these kids are going to be heirs of Judah, who is likely the heir of Jacob. So birth order matters. That's what they're trying to figure out. Now, today, we don't care who's born first necessarily, but they did then. So I wonder if one of our maternity nurses, in the case of uh, a twins or more, if there ever is any jockeying that might make some strange things happen, or if they find this to be um, very unlikely. Um, yeah. Either way, this is the history that has come to us and that's being interpreted. And what's most authoritative is the interpretation of this story, and that's dead on. The battle for supremacy among those blessed by God is from birth. Right, right. They're born with it. Right, right. And and the the uh, the difficulty of 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 that uh, being expressed. I mean, could so much more detail there than than it, even anywhere in the beginning of this chapter. That that is the overweighing emphasis of the of that. Even yeah, even this is where the weight falls. Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, the the implications of that are are going to be are huge as well. Like like you've said already. So uh, well, one of these kids is now in the line of the Messiah. 
Right. He's going to be in the line of David and therefore in the line of Jesus. So um, this, this is another one. And this is a woman, Tamar, mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the uh, and, and, you know, it also uh, uh, emphasizes as well inclusion of the, gener the, the nations, the, the promise to Abraham to be a right. blessing to the nations is, a, is another tie in here that's vitally important to, for, for us to understand too. Yeah, because in the line of the Messiah, several women are mentioned. Um, Tamar, she's a Canaanite, right? Rahab, she was a one who lived in Jericho. She's also in the line of the Messiah. Bathsheba, who married a Hittite, so is likely a Hittite, but in either case comes into the family line in sordid ways, not unlike Tamar does. And then, um, are there any others? And those are the ones that stand out. Oh, Ruth. Yeah. And Ruth's yeah, a Moabite. Yeah. So, you know, they all get mentioned by Matthew. Yeah. And that's unusual. You don't usually mention the mothers in those genealogies, but Matthew does. He makes sure he points out these and Tamar's one of them. So this is not an insignificant story. Right. Right. And, and I think you've, you've made some, drawn some conclusions too, that to, to help with, with, uh, the struggle of, of, uh, you know the, the very name Jacob in Israel, the struggle, uh, and it, and to bring it to probably to more more to where we're at today, uh, there there are these these constant struggles within us between, but are we going to depend on on our intelligence or our our human wisdom, our our desperation to to determine and filter everything that happens to us, or are we going to allow allow God to to take these 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 experiences we have and help us to interpret them to what they mean for us today. And uh, I know that can be tricky. Well, and we scary can take, for people. We can take these things to the Lord in prayer mm -hmm. where it, it seems clear to me that either Judah didn't know he could, or he couldn't at that time. God had not made that agreement because you never see him praying going, Lord, why did Ur die? What would you like me to do? You know, um, he never, he never consults the Lord about these things. He just, he lives as though there is no God. He just is making his best decisions. We are in a different situation. We can pray. And no wonder Moses said, what people are there like us who can, who the Lord comes near to when we pray? You know, that is such an honor. And it's one that's given to Israel later, but it's clearly not an expectation of these patriarchs. They're very much on their own. Yeah, Judah hasn't had that Bethel experience that that Jacob had, and J and Jacob his experiences were were they were they were a, a little gap, should we say? Um, so so with the the tensions of what what Jacob's sons have experienced, you got to wonder where 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 the, these times could be fit in edgewise, if yeah. you would say. Well, as far as, you know, I'm doing this a little bit from memory. Obviously, God has been interacting with Joseph through dreams and through his interpretation of dreams. Um, but I don't think anyone gets a direct uh, confrontation with God the way Jacob does, again, until Moses. Hmm. I think I'm right about that. That's a long time. Right. And, or, or in general, this, this could be... A, a a like a precursor this story being a precursor to to the a fulfillment of what of one of the dreams of joseph that this would be a a, a humbling experience for right. for judah this is a physical right. humbling uh with the realization that that he's next in line and and especially in line for 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 the messiah yeah this was quite a turn for him huh when he he has them dragging her out to kill her. And then he has to admit that he's the father of the children. And then he raises them. <laughs> yeah. No, it's definitely a humbling experience for him. I'm sure. Um, so yeah. And that is what Joseph's dreams were. So I think we see why the writer of Genesis puts this story where it, where he does it, it in some ways recapitulates the jockeying for birth order that is happening among joseph's brothers which is really the precipitating cause of sending him to egypt is because he had the robe and he was clearly the 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 one who was going to inherit and so that jockeying becomes amplified here in judah's own family and so judah is the is part of the machination of that jockeying with joseph and and it comes to root 
roost in his own house among his own children, um, causing great problems. So you can see how this story belongs here. And then it shows that his own children fought in the womb. So he's taken something and brought it to the very genetics of his house. You know what I mean? So it, it's right that it's here. And it also prepares us for what's coming next mm -hmm. with what's going to happen with Joseph and what's going to happen when his brothers are forced to come and interact with him. And it all comes to a head when Joseph gets his brothers alone at the end and is going to reveal who he is. What's he going to do? All of this prepares us for that. It, it, it builds the tension by showing us these conflicts over many generations and in many different places. So we, reading this well, we're going to expect that Joseph is going to, he's going to do what everybody else has done. He's going to show people what, what time it is once they realize who he is. But if we, so we're going to be ready for the tension in the Joseph story now, right? We'll be ready yeah. for it. Oh, yeah. They sold him down the river. Get rid of the guy. Let's get yeah. rid of him. So that's where we come next. When we get in next week, we're going to find out what happens to Joseph when he arrives in Egypt. We already know that he was sold to Potiphar, one of the lead officials, but that's as much as we know. Yeah. Yeah. So in this short story of Judah, Tamar is actually Joseph. Yeah. She could is. You, I, you think, I think you're right. I think that's a good insight. Yeah. Taken so, from her home into a family and then misused. Yeah. Interesting, and, huh? And Joseph is the one taken into Egypt. Yeah. Another good reason. That's a good pull, Minister Joe. A good reason this story would be here. Hmm. Right. And, it, and let's not forget, Judah is going to play a significant part in the Joseph story. And he's going to be very different in the Joseph story after 39 than he was before. And we might also have this story to show us how, how it was that he changed because he's much humbler yeah. and much more sacrificial than he, he started out. So again, yes, he experienced Joseph in his own house. I think you're right to say that. That'll yeah. preach, I think. <laughs> Next Sunday, that's for you. you yeah, got no, it. not for me. Not for me. It's for you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Minister Joe. Any final words for the folks? Yeah, I, I just want you to, I, I would just, just really try to encourage you to, to not act so quickly in desperation. Just just take your time and, and process some of this stuff. And I mean, COVID, COVID is, the pandemic has been hard on people. Uh, hard in a lot of ways, uh, kind of reoccurring cycles. It, it 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 has touched so many people in different ways. But I, I I'm beginning to think that that there are some things that we can learn through this about the about the church, about our faith, what how how we're to walk through this time. And I think this is being illuminated by the by by reading the scriptures and, and realizing that 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 things don't just happen for. In, in, in a vacuum or just happen in, in such a way that, that we can't learn from them. We, there's vital things that we can connect with. And so we have to make some changes. We have to, we have to, to, to learn, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure Judah was desperate in some ways. I really think that I, and, and I just, just want to reinforce that all of them seem desperate in, the, in some ways to me. And maybe that's just a, a common theme. But uh, we, we have to be careful that, that we, we don't get lost in all that and, and uh, ask God, just ask him directly, what, what, are you trying to, what are you trying to tell me through this? How can I live differently and how can I walk with you through these things? Because it's, it's often not easy. Right. Um, and, and, uh, and that's the key, isn't it, Minister Joe? It's we... We don't have to live by our wits or by our common sense or by our best guess the way Judah did, the way Tamar did, because we've been given the law of God and the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the apostles. And so for us, we can consult the wisdom of God in prayer as well mm -hmm. and in study of his word. So when we find ourselves in situations like this, like COVID, like you're saying, 
we're not in the situation Judah was in or Tamar was in, where we just have to try and figure out the best possible course given what we know. Uh, we're not in that situation unless we make ourselves in that situation, unless we cut ourselves off from God, unless we think that the word is irrelevant to us and we don't pray because what we think God doesn't listen or it's a waste of time or whatever. You can make yourself, force yourself to live in the world of Judah and Tamar, but we don't have to. We have been given graces that they did not have. And in times like COVID and other times, it's the word, prayer, fellowship of believers that can help us to navigate our way. We should be in a far better situation to determine a course more honoring to God than they were. Don't live eating from the tree of knowledge. You know, we have access to the tree of life through our faith in Christ, through our trust in his word, and through the prayers of the saints, right? Mm -hmm. Living saints. I'm not encouraging people to go ask the dead ones to pray for them, but. Right. Yeah, it's, it's again and again where we're, what God, what, what are you saying to, to me through this? Let's, let's, uh, let's not, you know, there, we don't want to live like I think it was it Paul said who, People don't want to be live like people who, who have no hope. You know. Both Judah and Joseph are going to learn a lot between the last time they met and the next, and they're going to be fundamentally different people, mm -hmm. and that is a very hopeful thing. Yeah. Because sometimes we believe that we're stuck with whoever we are, but Judah and Joseph, the last time they met, and the next will be very different. That's true. Yep. Yeah. So, and so, so can we, right? Yeah. Yeah. And how much more? Yeah. How much because, more? because Christ has come and Jesus is Lord and he has sent his Holy Spirit and he's given us his word. How much more? How much I mean, more? if Judah and Joseph could change, what, what excuse is there for you and me? None. <laughs> well, thank you, Minister Joe. And thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you.